So we started last week talking about how we start off the year, how we start out really anything matters. How we start matters. It can make the difference on how we finish. A good start often results in a good finish. In a similar manner, the way that we launch into a new year can determine what we experience that year. The way we launch or start a new year out can determine the level of success that we're going to have that year. It can determine how much peace we're going to experience that year. And the way we start off a year, kind of that trajectory that we determine to get in at the beginning of the year, can also determine how much God stuff we're going to get to be involved in. How many of you want to be involved in a lot of God stuff this year? Come on. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. Let's remember that the Lord has what you need. He has all you need to start your year out right. And that's the the series that we're in just here in January, starting off the year. Start your year out right. Last week we talked about how fasting, and if you weren't here, we we're taking the whole shot challenge, by the way, which is a fasting challenge. We're fasting one day a week, one 24-hour period a week here at Evident Life Church. And then the last week of the month, we're going to engage in a three-day fast. So everyone who's physically able, who gets the okay from your doctor and all that kind of stuff. Now, if you're a young guy who's super healthy, you don't have to go to the doctor probably to ask if it's okay. I know that you want to get a little pink slip from him so you don't have to go to class you know, or, or fast. But, um, but we're doing this whole shot challenge. You got to listen last week if you want to understand why I'm calling it the whole shot challenge. It, it does make sense. Um, and we talked about fasting last week and how if we start our year off seeking the Lord and using all the tools, all the means that he's given us to connect and interact with him, how that can affect our year, how we can find so much more of God and engage so much deeper with him. Today, we are going to check out an ancient key that unlocks the abundance of heaven. And you're like, where is this guy going? It sounds kind of mysterious, maybe a little bit like Indiana Jones. Uh, this ancient key that unlocks the abundance of heaven. What we're going to talk about this morning is the key of generosity. That's the title of today's message, the key of generosity. And how if we grab this key and use this key called generosity, how it can unlock, literally unlock heaven for us this year. I love what God's Word says in Proverbs 18, verse 16. It says that a gift, and I'm going to say generosity, a gift opens the way. In other words, generosity, giving, a gift, opens the way. It's a key that unlocks what God has for us and what He desires to do in us and through us. I was doing some research this week on generosity. Surprise, yes, kind of not surprised, but ultimately, yes, surprised that most Americans don't feel rich when we are. And on the other side of that coin, most Americans think that we're generous when, by large part, we're not. We don't think we're rich, but we think we're generous. Are we aware that half the world lives on 2 to $3 a day? Half the world lives on 2 to $3 a day. It costs more than that for a cup of coffee over at Dutch Bros across the parking lot here. I'm here to tell you that you're seriously rich. Everyone in this room, you are seriously rich. How many of you actually own a car? Raise your hand if you own a car. I know you may have payments on it, but you're making the payments, so you own a car, okay? You own a car. I mean, virtually everyone old enough to drive and even some younger, you know, five, six-year-olds <laughs> say they have a car. He probably does, you know, a little, little car like that. If you own a car, I mean, a car that you can get into, turn the key, and it starts, and it can take you from point A to point B. 
doesn't need to be fancy. If you own a car, you are in the top 6 to 9% of the wealthiest people in the world today. If you own one car. Some of you are so filthy rich, you own more than one car. A lot of you get in your car, and when you get home, you push this button. And when you push this button, magically this big door begins to open up. And you drive that car that 94% of the world isn't privileged to do, is drive a car, and you drive it into a thing called a garage, right? And what is a garage? A garage is basically a house for your car. And some of us have two cars, and we're able to drive two cars into our garage that is a house for two cars. And some of us even have a house for our cars that will fit three cars, but we don't have three cars. Instead, we use the third part of our garage house for all the stuff that we can't fit into our house. I mean, that's how rich we really are. Compare that to two or three dollars a day. Half of the world. We're rich. We're rich. We're rich. We don't think we're rich, but we are. But we think we're generous, and we're really not. Did you know that the average person in the United States only gives 2.8% of their income away to others, to help others. 2.8%, and I'm not talking about taxes. I'm talking about, you know, gifts, helping others in some form, some kind of generosity. 2.8% is the average. Those who make $100,000 or more, it actually goes down. It's 2.6% of their income that they give away. Imagine how many people need to make up for all those who give nothing just to get it up to 2.6%. It's unbelievable. We think we're not rich, but we are. We think we're generous here in America, in, in, in the West, and overall, we're not. We're just not. Why don't we give more? And I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir. So don't be, you know, feeling condemnation or anything. This church is full of generous people, and I'm going to highlight that here in a little bit in this message. But overall, as Americans even today, the richest time in history, why is it that we don't give more? It's because we don't think we have enough to give. And so we become afraid to give. What if I give and I don't have enough? Here's what happens to many of us. Number one, God supplies. And how many of you know that God is our supplier? He supplies everything. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Every good and perfect gift comes from heaven. Everything we have, that car, that garage, that coffee, and everything we have comes from God. He generously supplies for us. So God supplies, and then what do we do? We consume. We take what God supplies, and we consume what he supplies. We buy the coffee, right? We get the iPhone uh, 10, the iPhone X, right? We, we get new shoes, so on and so forth. We go out to eat. We, we consume what God has generously supplied to the point that we lack because we consume it all. We consume too much. And then when we find ourselves in that place of lack, we're afraid because there's more month than there is money left. And so we don't give, and we start the process all over. The next month, God, in his mercy, his mercies are new every morning. He once again supplies all of our needs generously. Another paycheck comes in, another gift comes in, another miracle happens, and we're provided for, and we go through the whole cycle again. We consume, and then we lack, and then we're afraid, and, and, and we're, we're just in this rat race that the enemy loves to have us in. The cycle, it's a consumer cycle. But there's another cycle. There's another way we can live. And God invites us to live this way. It's the way of generosity. 
We can say no to the consumer cycle, and we can say yes to God's cycle, and that is the cycle of generosity. It says this in 2 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 9. God's Word declares, as Scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Your coffee might not be remembered forever. But your generous good deeds will be remembered forever. Verse 10, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of what? Of what? Of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. It's important to break the cycle of consumerism. And it's important to engage in the economy of heaven, which is generosity. And so we're going to look at three different reasons why it's important to grab hold of the key of generosity. Three different reasons. Why does the key of generosity important? And what does the key of generosity unlock? Number one, generosity unlocks miracles. Why break the cycle of consumerism? Why engage in generosity? Because the key of generosity unlocks miracles. Gospel of John, chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. You all will remember this episode, right? When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy the bread for all these people? I think, how are we going to feed these folks, right? And he asked this to test him because, of course, he already knew what was going to happen. So Philip answered Jesus and he said, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have even a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. And he said, hey, check this out. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There's plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. It was 5,000 men. Then you had the women and the children on top of that. So we're talking over 10,000 people. Jesus then took the loaves, he gave thanks, and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. That's pretty incredible. How many of you would say that's a miracle? That's a miracle, right? It's a miracle. So there was this regular boy who was able to unlock the riches, the majesty, and the miracles of heaven when he generously gave his entire lunch to the ministry of Jesus. He gave what he had, his whole lunch, to the ministry of Jesus, and Jesus took what was generously given, and a miracle occurred. A miracle occurred. What do we learn from this boy? When we give generously to the ministry of Jesus, we too will find ourselves in the middle of miracles. As the Lord takes the little that we give and He multiplies it. And He stretches it. And He blows people's minds. And He takes care of those who have a need. See, we can be like that boy. We can generously give to the ministry of Jesus and find ourselves in the middle of a miracle. The key of generosity unlocks miracles. Now sometimes the little that we provide will take care of a people's physical needs like it did on this day. They were hungry. They needed to eat. And the little that that boy provided took care of the physical needs, filled the stomachs to the full of over 10,000 people. 
miraculous, incredible. But other times, the generous little that we give will be used by our miracle-working God. And what will happen? Thousands will be fed with the gospel and come to salvation in Christ Jesus. That's what can happen when we use the key of generosity. It can unlock salvation for thousands upon thousands upon thousands. How many of you remember the first John Bible translation project that we did just over a year ago? How many of you remember that? We got to be involved and generously give and work with Wycliffe and the seed company to pay for, completely fund, the Bible translation of 1 John for the people in the Biso region of Ethiopia. And there's over 10,000 people in the Biso region of Ethiopia who do not have Scripture in their heart language, in their native tongue. But because we generously gave, over 10,000 are being fed with truth, God's living and active Word that transforms, that brings life, that brings light where there was darkness. Generosity, the little that we gave, God takes and he multiplies and he affects tens of thousands of people with truth, bringing exactly what they need so that they too can find salvation in Christ Jesus. It's the multiplier factor of heaven. It's the key of generosity at work that is unlocking miracles, even right now over in the Biso region of Ethiopia. Miracles are happening as people are coming out of darkness into the light, the life, salvation in and through Christ Jesus because of generosity over here on the other side of the world. That's exciting. That's what God can do when we choose to use the key of generosity. So do you desire to be part of miracles? Do you want to find yourself in the middle of miracles? Well, the key is generosity. It's going to unlock those miracles in your life this year. You're going to find yourself in the middle of things that are going to blow your mind and humble you and have you saying, oh God, thank you for letting me be part of this. Thank you for letting me be part of this. So I want you to even dream. Even dream right now. What kind of miracles do you want to be part of this year? What kind of big things of God do you want to see happen? Let that Let that help motivate you to choose generosity this year and to give to the ministry of Jesus. So what does the key of generosity unlock? It unlocks miracles. The second thing I want to look at here as we dive into God's Word is that the key of generosity, it unlocks involvement. And when I'm talking about involvement, I'm talking about involvement in God's stuff. Generosity gets us involved in God's stuff. Turn with me to Matthew Chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem, this is Jesus and his disciples. This is on their way to uh, Palm Sunday, before Palm Sunday. They're approaching Jerusalem, and they came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. And at that time, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. Now, if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. You all remember that, right? That episode? What all happened there? We can learn about generosity from this, can't we? I mean, check this out. There was a man who generously gave his donkey to the Lord. Just generously gave his donkey. And because he generously gave his donkey, he got to be involved in kingdom of God things. He got to be involved in redemptive history. He got to be involved in fulfilling prophecy. This man, we don't even know his name. But he's mentioned here in the Bible. He's highlighted in the Bible. He's part of redemptive history. He's part of the cross and the resurrection. All of that. He got to be involved because he operated in generosity toward the Lord. People who generously give to the work of God get to be involved. They just do. They get to have a significant role in the things of God. They get to be involved in the important stuff that's not temporal, but 
eternal. People who operate in and through generosity. I think it's important to note that this guy who gave, I mean, check this out. He didn't ask any questions. Hey, would you give your donkey and that, that, that colt? Would you give those to the Lord? The Lord needs to use them right now. He didn't ask any questions. Well, exactly how is he going to use them? He didn't ask how long. How long are you going to have my donkey? Is the mission and the reason that you want it, Lord, really important and worthy of me investing in right now and putting myself out for that? He didn't ask all those questions. He didn't go into those details and try to pick apart what's really happening here. And, and, and you know, if I'm going to give, I need to kind of control the situation and, and what kind of transpires here. No, he simply generously gave to the Lord with no strings attached. And he got to be involved in fulfilling prophecy. Do you want to be the one who supplies the vehicle that brings Jesus to others? I do. I want to be involved. I want to be one of the folks that supplies the vehicle, that even is the vehicle that brings Jesus, that brings salvation, that brings hope to other people. That's what I want to be involved in this year and every year. I don't want to miss out because I'm asking too many questions. I don't want to miss out because, because I'm stingy with my donkey. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't want to miss out. I want to be the vehicle. I want to supply the vehicle. I want to be involved in redemptive history. I want to be involved in fulfilling prophecy. Every tongue, every tribe, every nation, people hearing the gospel and coming to Jesus, I want to be involved in that. And I don't, they don't need to know my name. They don't need to know our name. But I want us to be involved. I want to do the things that matter for all eternity. Here's the neat thing. As a church family, we have been. Got some pictures up here of some of the stuff that we've done in the Volta region of Ghana, Africa. We've been giving generously toward the work of bringing Jesus to people in this Volta region for years now, like 10, 11 years. And the generosity has directly resulted in multiple churches being planted. And we're talking churches being planted in villages where there's no church. I mean, out in the middle of nowhere called what? The bush over there. And now there are churches in these areas which means there's the gospel in these areas, which means there's a gathering of the saints, which means there's discipleship, which means there's transformation, which means there's salvation that are coming to whole villages and families and regions because of the generosity of folks here in Gilbert, Arizona that's being sown and given generously on the other side of the world. Other things that we're involved in, we've been funding crusades that are happening over there where where we go out at night and we put up big sound systems and, and, and lights and running off of generators and start praising and worshiping the Lord and preaching the gospel. And then you see people coming out of the darkness, literally coming out of the darkness and gathering in this area. And then there's opportunity for them to receive ministry and healing, the presence of God and ultimately salvation. And we've seen hundreds upon hundreds of people come to Christ through these crusades that we have fully funded that have gone on over there, as well as people being baptized. That's me right there. In the, in the orange shirt with Pastor Emmanuel, baptizing these young men into Christ Jesus. Exciting stuff. Generosity. Bringing the vehicle that brings Jesus to whole regions. We're involved in that. But it's because of generosity. If we didn't give the donkey, you know what I mean? If we didn't give, none of this stuff would be happening. There wouldn't be a church in, in Weta Junction, in Ohau. I want to tell one other story. Jimmy, you remember this one. Here's, here's how powerful the gospel is and, and what kind of change can happen in the kind of things we can be involved in when we're generous. Even 
Juju priests, which are witch doctors over there, are coming to Jesus as a result of the activities that we're involved in over in Ghana, Africa. There was one juju priest, one witch doctor that we actually met that's now part of the church over there, that's part of Evident Life Chapel over there in Weta Junction now. And he was a witch doctor. And we were involved in, in watching him say, take all of my idols, take all of this, this junk that I used to. And it was weird stuff. It's like what you see in the movies and then even some. It was strange. I'm talking chickens and stuff. I'm talking crazy stuff, right? And take all this stuff and burn it. I'm done with it. And he even changed his name. This witch doctor even changed his name to Abraham. I mean, we're talking complete change. What does that do to his family? What does that do to that village when the witch doctor comes to Jesus Christ and he burns all of his idols and stuff? It's big. Generosity, though. Generosity allows us to be involved in that kind of God-sized stuff. Man, that's humbling. It's exciting. The third thing I want to look at, what does generosity unlock? Generosity unlocks the heart of Jesus. Generosity touches the heart of God. And I know we all want to touch God's heart. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 7. A woman came to Jesus with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. They couldn't believe it. They were offended. Why? Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor will always have, always be with you and and you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. She did something that was also very prophetic. Pretty exciting. Generosity? Man. So Jesus says, truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So the extravagant generosity of this woman, a whole year's wages of oil poured on Jesus' head. It bothered the disciples. They didn't get it. Their flesh, their minds couldn't comprehend it. It, 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 it. it confounded them, but it touched the heart of Jesus. Deeply touched his heart. Generosity. I've watched some in this church family touch the Father's heart in very profound, deep ways. As so many have given generously to the Evident Life Church Adoption Assistance Program that we call Evident Love. We've had many families, many children that have been affected in such beautiful ways because of generosity. Children that were able to be adopted, that to go from being fatherless to being placed in a family because of the generosity of this church. And when I'm talking generosity, I'm not talking a few bucks here. I'm talking about tens of thousands and tens of thousands of dollars that have been generously given, that have touched the heart of the Father, that heart of adoption, that heart to bring the fatherless into families. It's touched the heart of God. This generosity has touched the heart of God. It's also touched the heart of a nation as if you want to put this picture up here, I mean, it got recognized. The generosity of this church giving to the adoption assistance program and what that's done for children and families was actually recognized by Congress in Washington, D.C., which is pretty cool. But ultimately, we don't do it. This was just like, okay, whatever. We don't do it for the applause of man. That's not why we're generous. That's not why we get behind the heart of God and give. This was never on the radar at all. What was on the radar is God's heart is for these kids to be placed in families. And so this church generously gave as unto the Lord. And I'm telling you, touched the heart of God profoundly. Why do we give? Because He generously gave. 
He first generously gave to us. He gave what? He gave it all. And so we're generous with Jesus because he's worthy and because he's worth it. It's actually the area of generosity that God challenges us to test him in. You're familiar with Malachi 3. I'm going to read it. We need to be reminded of this every once in a while. Just kind of give us a little little push. Uh, Verse 8. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, which is really generosity. Robbing me in generosity. You're under a curse. Your whole nation because you're robbing me. 2.6%. I think that's bringing blessing, or is that is that kind of indicating? I don't know. Verse ten: Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. What's the storehouse? It's the church. It's the ministry that's taking place. You know, the church is the vehicle that God has chosen to use on this earth right now to bring His kingdom, to bring His light, to bring His love, to touch the nations. It's the church that God has chosen to use as a vehicle for that. And when I talk about the church, I'm not talking about just the institution. I'm talking about us, the people, gathered together to do the ministry, to get behind the ministry, to hear what God is saying for such a time as this, and then to move forward in that ministry and watch the miracles happen, the abundance happen as we get to be involved in bringing Jesus to others. He says, test me in this, in this generosity says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. Are you having issues with not enough money left at the end of the month? Are you, are, are you sensing that your, your possessions and your, your finances are being devoured and you don't know why? Here's, here's an indicator right here. Generosity, he says, he'll bless us and prevent pests from devouring our crops. And the vines of your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord God Almighty. It's the economy of God. Generosity touches the heart of God. It unlocks miracles. It gets us involved in the things of God and it brings blessing. And it can actually break curses that are on us. Generosity is powerful. Just like last week we talked about, fasting is powerful. I've heard that tithing is really the lowest form of faith. Seriously, it's the starting point. Think about it this way. Think about tithing. And tithing is like just the beginning of generosity. Tithing is a form of obedience, and it's the beginning of faith. Because think about this. If we can't trust God with 10% of what he's abundantly blessed us with, who are we to ever think that we're truly trusting him with our eternal souls, with our eternity, with salvation? If God isn't big enough to take care of us and to provide for us and to to show up in power and in might in our lives with 90% of what he's given us, if we can't trust him with that, how are we thinking we're truly trusting him with our eternity? Generosity unlocks faith. It moves us into places that are phenomenal, that are miraculous, that are are blessed. It takes us places that we will never go without that key. It opens doors in our lives that will never be opened unless we use that key of generosity. The longer I'm alive, the longer I'm walking with Jesus, the more I'm learning about this truth. More I'm using that key. Praise God. I love this passage of Scripture, and we're about to close. It says, Give, this is in Luke 6, give, and it will be given to you. I'm going to sing it. Give, and it will come back to you. Press down, shaken together, and running over. You all know that song? Give, and it will come back to you. When you give, give to the Lord. That's Luke 6, verse 38. When we give, man, God takes it and boom. He does the God-sized stuff with it. So this year, I don't want to miss out. And I know you don't want to miss out. I don't want to sell us short in any way. 
I don't want to be involved in the less than. I want to be involved in the more than stuff of God. I, I want to be used by the Lord for the miraculous. I want to be involved in the big things of God. And I want to touch God's heart. So I want to ask that, that we would be those people that would get on board with God's economy. And we would say no once and for all and break this, this curse of this consumer lifestyle and instead choose the path of generosity. And let's watch what God will do with us and through us this year. I guarantee you this, it will be big and it will blow our minds. Let's stand up, church.